Jeff Johnson, founder of Franchise Research Institute. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Patrick. Could you tell me a little bit of background about how you started Franchise Research Institute as well as your background in the franchising space? It's hard to believe, but I'm celebrating my 40th year in franchising. I was 29 years old, living in Dallas, Texas, working for a Fortune 500 company, and I'd had it, you know, the, the meetings, the and constantly trading time for money just didn't make sense to me anymore. And so I quit my job, wife and two kids moved back to Nebraska, so hometown of Lincoln, and bought the Schlotsky's franchise. And so I was a Schlotsky's franchisee in 1984, opened three locations in four years. I, w I was- the, Sounds fun to me. It, you're out, it you're was, out. I really, it was a grand adventure. And um, Schlotsky started selling area developerships. And so the, the chain grew tremendously. We went from 200 to 750 locations. The company went public. Everybody bought stock. So it went public in 95 and bankrupt in 2004. So I had sold my locations to be an area developer and area developers do not survive bankruptcy. So I'm out on the street. I'd had 17 years and I really was, I was in the room when it happened. I was in, I was on the franchise advisory council and I was on the marketing council and the president's council. So when things were going great and it was really going, I was in the room. And when the wheels came off and things started to crash, I was also in the room. So what what led to Schlotsky's implosion? How did this franchise brand that it's quite iconic blow up? It, and it was, I love the brand. I love the food. They lost their way when it went public and all the senior staff had stock bonuses. Now, I'm sure you're going to get other stories from other people, but that's from my perspective, what happened. And so now the focus of the franchisor is on raising the stock price. It came out at 10. It was as high as 20 at one time per share. And, but they, you start doing the kickback stuff. So Shlosky starts making money in all this. They make money off the marketing fees. They make, um, the buildings had to get bigger. Sales went up. Royalties went up, but we're still in the sandwich business, right, Patrick? And so, now my rent's gone from 2000 a month to 12000 a month, and I'm still, it's sales going. So the bottom line is franchisees aren't making any money. And so stores kind of close, story gets out, validation goes down, and the wheels come off. And I knew then, that's when I started the Franchise Research Institute and started doing surveys. I knew there was a disconnect between the communication with franchisees and what the franchisor heard, okay? So... Franchise executives are sitting there and they have false praise in one ear. So they want the teacher's pet. I'll tell you what I'm sure you want to hear. And then you have the chronic complainers in the other ear. And so franchise executives are kind of going, I thought it was a good meeting. I, you know, I don't know. I don't have any way to quantify it or really build it. There was no platform where franchisees felt like they could share their truth. And that's when I started. I've, I contacted a university professor. He was the uh, department chair at the University of Nebraska. And so we wrote the methodology. I was not interested in another spin, you know, another uh, Yelp survey. I wanted to have it dialed in. I wanted to be able to sit down with the president of the company or the owner of the company and say, here's what the data tells you. And so, you know, in the old Peter Drucker back in the 70s, the business guy. So when I was in business school, Peter Drucker, it's the old, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so if we're not measuring our performance as a franchise or as a franchise organization, then we can't do it. So that's when it all started. I started going to IFA meetings. And interestingly, I did, early client was Annie Ann's. And Annie Ann's is then bought by another company. And it, it just, they buy and, you know, private equity and that all gets around. Then I'm all of a sudden I'm doing Schlotsky's franchisees again. <laughs> so I did a decade of their surveys, almost full circle. It was kind of weird. Is there any commonalities that you've picked up on all these years with, with the surveys? The, the data really does tell you some interesting things. When you take it, when you take the results of, you know, a lot of studies and you kind of plot them on a chart, there really is a bell curve. I mean, there are some franchise opportunities at one end that you just don't want to get involved in. Most are somewhere in the middle, though, on the bell curve. And then it's that group of the, the extraordinary, the folks that are really that top five or 10%. What do they do that's different? And what we found out was those folks really understood that they were really in two different businesses. They're in the customer facing business, net promoter. I mean, we survey customers to death anymore. You know, you check out of the hotel, Marriott wants to know how they did. You get check, you get out of the Uber, they want to know. You check in at United Airlines, they want to, 
they want you to tell them how clean the bathroom is at the airport. So we were obsessed with customer satisfaction. But then the whole side of France, they're also in the franchisee business, which is a whole different kind of business. So that top group really understand we got to make customers crazy, you know, crazy fans for the burrito or whatever it is that we sell. But at the same time, we got to do the same kind of thing with franchisees. There are our partners in this, and yet we have no way to quantify to measure the quality of the relationship, but also just all the pieces, the initial training. I mean, we get surveys back that say, I went through two weeks of training, got back home, and no one ever told me how to run the cash register. So if we're not getting that kind of feedback, we're never going to improve all the key elements, whether it's social media or training or site selection, all the things the franchisor are supposed to bring to the table. So I'll pause here because I probably went down one of those rabbit holes, Patrick. Well, so I'm curious. So like the, the most successful franchisors that you've worked with over, you know, your 30 plus years in the space, they really preserve and, and grow that, that franchise brand equity with the, the end consumer, as well as their, what they're listening, their they're supporting their their franchisees, which is almost kind of another customer. They're, they're hyper focused on those two aspects, you would say? Yeah, there and there really are two different businesses. So you have to have French when you're doing the franchise side of it, they really have to know the fran one of the biggest challenges franchisors have today is setting realistic expectations for the franchisees, the new folks. So when you're meeting with Friend, you know, the, the sales guys say, I, you know, I can't tell them everything or I'm never going to sign a deal and I've got a quota for how many I'm supposed to sell. But then the operations guys say, well, but then you toss them in my bucket and you've told them this, this and this. So there has to be a balance between that. But the franchisors that really succeed, they don't need to do the, as much selling because the franchisee community is doing that. You know, they're telling the story and they get out of the, the annual conventions and they go, I got to call my you know, fraternity buddy. He's in Columbus, Ohio, and he's looking for a business deal. I got to get him into this. So when you, if you build it right and you really understand that I need to partner with franchisees, because in many cases, they're the closest ones to the customer. And so it's this triad of the business, the franchisor, the franchisee, and the customer. And how does that dynamic work around? And so that's what, that's the focus of, the franchise brands that uh, it really works and that you know everyone's making money and i'm sure the net promoter score is is super high on the other side you mentioned the slotsky publicly traded company the the executives are more focused on you know where the stock prices were going and maybe manipulating the opening numbers or, or different factors that pop up the the stock price what other things are franchisors that aren't doing it right it right you know focused on well, they're focused on sales you know you need to get to some point with royalties where you can really live on royalties and you don't have to sell so if you can find a brand that has balanced those two you know I've always I've made those com the comments before that franchising is really like sex because it, it's a unicorn. It's not like anything else. There's no good analogy because it is such a unique thing. And then you start to look for definitions. And the best definition I found was um, it, it was in an Australian franchise website. And it said franchising is a commercial marriage. And I really like that definition because the commercial part of that definition to me says it's return on investment. So it's the franchise performance. You know, it's, can I make money at this deal? But then the marriage part of it is, this is a long-term relationship. I'm signing a 10-year deal and hoping to renew it for 10 more. And franchisees can't, if customers aren't happy, they go across the street. I'll, I'll buy the burrito or the burger or the whatever. So you got lots of options. Franchisees can't do that. But yet, you and I wouldn't even take a vacation without looking at reviews, right? We don't go to a movie without looking at reviews. You don't buy a microwave without looking at reviews. And so th the real secret, I think, lies in what the franchisee can share with you. And when I did the the Schlotsky's deal, Schlotsky's is out of Austin, Texas. And so there's we, I was living in Dallas. And so when I would be traveling with a sales guy, we would work all day. And then at night, I'd go find the franchisee. And so I would... I would be able to do that portion of the due diligence in person. And it's it's really not very complicated. You know, it's how would you rate the quality of the franchisor? Knowing what you know now, would you do it again? And would you recommend the franchise? I mean, these are really, we do it all the time and other kinds of research, but it wasn't being done at all. 
in the, in the franchisee space. And I knew that for a franchisor to excel, they had to have this information. And so the two big cornerstones to what we do is it has to be comprehensive. I want access to every franchisee. If somebody signed a contract, I want their email address and I want to be able to reach out to them. So whether they're open or not, I still want to know what they had to say. And I want to complete surveys with over 70% of the franchisees. That's the only way I'm going to have a comprehensive look at what's going on. Folks that are in-state, out-of-state, big, multi-unit, single, been around 10 years, been around 10 months. So I really wanted to really capture that that voice of, of the friend. And then I wanted to guarantee confidentiality because nobody's going to tell me the truth if they think I'm going to share it. There's an old, There's a famous Schlotzky's. So it's a national convention for Schlotzky's. Brand new VP of marketing is hired. He's got the whole plan laid out. He's uh, came the... And the essence of the offer and the campaign and the there was TV support, radio, everything was for a free pickle. So that if you ordered the sandwich, the drink and the chips or potato salad or whatever, you'd get a free pickle. Well, you can imagine what franchisees are saying in the hallway <laughs> during the break. I mean, they're just like, no, you got you. But no one rose. Nobody raised their hand that just said this is a bad idea. So, again, there has to be an independent third party, quantify, share everything. We do quantitative as well as qualitative questions. So if you wouldn't do it again, the second question that we ask, we want to know why. If you wouldn't recommend, why? So there, there's a lot of follow up. And that's really where you get the, we had just completed a project for Buffalo Wild Wings. And I, I presented the research in Minneapolis to the current president of the company. And he said, you know, the verbatim responses are where the real gold is, you know, and we ask questions like, you know, what, um, what one thing could the franchisor do to increase franchisee success and profitability? And then we just wait, you know, it's the, it's you, you don't know what you don't know till you just ask lots of those questions. And then if you get, I mean, what if you get 20, 30, 40 responses that are essentially the same thing? Now you've got something. So you can tell this isn't a job for me, right, Patrick? I mean, this is truly a passion. And we've got, we do a lot of work with emerging brands. You know, the brands are, you know, fewer than 100 franchisees. And they're just, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get there. What what do we not know that we need to know so we can get to that point? But also we do... Um, H&R Block has been a client for years of ours. We do a lot of food. Arby's is a client, Buffalo, Duncan, you know, all of those guys, uh, Jimmy John's. But also do um, Bright Star Care, Shelly Sons oh, yeah. Company. We do Express we Professional. Had the, we had one of the franchisees on. It seems like an incredible system. It's a great system. It's a complicated niche to be into for sure right now, especially with staffing. You know, we do a fair amount and just for... For those companies to find caregivers to go into the homes is just one of their biggest challenges. But that's business. That's one of the reasons I wanted to get into business because I think it's fun. If it's complicated and people are willing to pay for your expertise and your support to help them, there's usually money involved. Usually money involved. Yes, sir. Do you get into the profitability at all with, with the franchisees? We do ask some questions. We don't get numbers. Um, the, the, the challenge with doing that is everybody does their books differently. And... It It is, uh, I don't want to make a claim of return on investment to somebody because I don't know how they're doing their books. You know, it's like, it's, um, yeah, I'm, of course I'm writing off my Cadillac and I take the whole family to the convention that's in Miami Beach or whatever it is, but I just don't make, think I'm making as much money. Well, you're, you're taking 100000 out of the business and just all of those cell phones for you and your family, that, you know, all of this kind of stuff. So there's no way... That, that that value back in, but it's going to vary. You know, some people, they derive an extra 10, 15 K of value from the business and others might be 70 K. Yeah. And you're, you know, you're paying your kid in college for working at one of the, your Schlotzky's delis when he's not working at any, you know, he's just, so you're just sending, you're just writing off money you're sending to your son. So there's just so many games. You, know, you mentioned 
Tekken and some of these big restaurant franchises where they'll develop the land, there's the Propco, there's the operating company, the Opco, and maybe the Opco, it takes eight, nine years to make their money back on that investment. But the property co, they 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 sell, you know, in two years or once they get the certificate of occupancy to a big real estate, you know, investment trust. So if there's, it can be difficult to, to quantify. And, yeah, and pocket a lot off it. But I rely, I know there's a lot of tricks that you can play on FDDs and you know, financial performance. But the, for me, when you get down to the chase, there's really just two pillars to the success. It's one, it's return on investment. And that's FDD, whatever the company's telling you, then verify. But then the other part of it is validation. I mean, I want to know what friend, you have historical data that you can review on average unit sales and all that kind of stuff. But I want to know what's going on in the locker room right now, not last year or 10 years ago. What are they saying right now about you know, the coaches and the you know, game plan, you know, is this hot? Is it really working today? And, and FDDs can be dated, you know, they can be anywhere from, you know, 12 months in the past, 18 months in the past, yeah. depending on when it's released. And a lot of things can happen to that industry or that set franchise. Yeah, and which is, yeah, a lot can happen. I mean, and COVID is a great example, but really just any tax law change. I mean, there's lots of things that can happen that are fairly, you know, dramatic that are right now. And that's what we can do in real time. Tell you what franchise. I mean, my the the vision that I had was I would have all the franchisees in a room at the convention on the doors. It would say keep out. So all the executives are out and I go in with my clipboard and my questions and I just start rooting around and saying, asking the questions. And I think there's so much knowledge, so much value in there. They're in front of the end customer. Like I talked to an operator of car washes, a licensed business model franchise in some countries where they do a hundred thousand car washes wow. and it's the franchisees that are, you know, operating those businesses. So they have so much knowledge of what the customer is asking, what, what product innovations and, I do see it as a job, as the the role and job of the the franchisor to collect that information for then you know the product development to then and and marketing development to then push back out. Yeah, the franchise, and that's what a lot of a significant if the results are good. Okay, <laughs> a significant number of our clients will use the research report that we provide as the validation to candidates. And then they, you know, now you can call a handful of count, you know, candidate or a handful of franchisees and see if the research is right. You can validate the validation, but you don't have to get it, you know, for the candidate to get a hold of enough franchisees to really have an answer to that question. It's really hard, Patrick. I'm sure you've definitely we've reached out. I mean, I've spoken to over a thousand franchisees and it, it's a pain. I got to be persistent with like direct messages on, on LinkedIn, yeah. email, text. And they it can you, be hard. The, they're busy folks. If they're if they're good, they're busy. And so you leave a message, they try to call you back. You can't get the call and you go back. So how do you get a hold of and that's what we can do. So we can be the third party saying, I know these results are accurate because of the process and the methodology that we have. Again, it has to be good. I mean, no one's going to share bad data with a candidate, but when it is good, well, that's a that's a wonderful opportunity for the franchisor to say the validation piece. Here's the financial, here's the ROI, here's the stuff we have here, and here's what franchisees are saying. So for your model, the the franchisor is basically commissioning the study. Do you have any like Anything you sell directly to franchisees or prospective uh, franchisees? We don't. We encourage. So we we encourage the franchisor to share the data with franchisees. Now, the private conversations, the you know the quantitative, the I we don't. I think that's a private conversation between. But the data, the percentages, and then we started off working with the Paul Brown, the the RB CEO back in 2013, 2014, when he got the the first thing he did and he's really turned Arby's around we all know that we have the meats right but he he went on a road trip to talk to franchisees he commissioned us to do a project for him um, then he invited us to come to Atlanta and we met in his office and went through all the results and over the next five years to see how the franchisee feedback or satisfaction or whatever you want to call it the the numbers and how that had improved over that five year period now it's just data. You got to do something with it. It tells you quite a story. I mean, it's essentially an annual physical. So when you come out of the annual physical, here's your blood pressure and here's your cholesterol. Now it's what you do with the data, but 
this falls in this kind of a range. Here's where you really ought to, you know, put some, you know, more more work into whatever it is, legal training, you know, operational support. Field support's one of the huge topics right now is the who's my person and how can I get a hold of them and can they come help me? Yeah, so coach, right? Yeah, they're business coach. And so we'll do studies where we break out all of the results by 20 or 30 franchise business consultants. And so how do the numbers vary by business consultant? And okay. it's, there's some fascinating stuff to go in there. Now, I don't want anybody to get fired or, you know, for based on that. But what if there's, you know, double digit differences in, you know, in the support or the training based on the, the business coach? And the better ones, you know, document what they're doing right. And yeah. people can learn from those ones. So if this group are the high top performers and these group are kind of lagging, what's the difference? What, what? We just have wrong people. We don't have them trained properly. You know, what's going on? And one of the biggest beefs franchisees have, and I know you know this, is that, you know, I've been a franchisee for X number of years and every business consultant you send me, you're expecting me to train them because they essentially don't know anything. And so I'm part of your training. And then as soon as they learn, to, then all of a sudden they're onto another, you know, another gig. So this franchising really is a unicorn. It, it's, uh, um, you know, the IFE, uh, the... International Franchise Association always, you know, the line is, you know, be in business for yourself and not by yourself. Well, that's not entirely true. You're not really, you know, what do you really own at the end of the day? I mean, a, a franchise you know, you're is... Renting, you're renting a business model. Yeah, and I like to use, uh, it's a hunting license. You know, you have the opportunity to go do whatever it is during this time frame in this part of the, the state or the country. But if you don't do, I mean... You, it, you can't just, I'm not going to be able to sell you my hunting license. I mean, there it comes with all kinds of, you know, regulations and problems and lawyers and stuff that go with all of that. So I don't know. I think and it's, I think it's fascinating. Have you done any studies? You know, we talked about what the franchisors that are really succeeding doing with the data and what their focus is on. What about the franchisees? What are those top performing franchisees doing that the, the low performers aren't doing? The, the one thing that we hear from, we ask about annual conventions, you know, did you, have you attended one? And, you know, networking opportunities is the one thing we hear most about from franchisees when they get together. Do they have opportunities to talk to other friends? I remember when I was a franchisee, I'd take my financial statements down and sit down with other franchisees and go through food costs and labor. Where are you at and how do you do this and all that kind of stuff. And so much of that is franchisee to franchisee. And um, and that's OK. You can still, as a franchisor, help facilitate opportunities for franchisees to network and talk and uh, compare notes. And that's one of the huge benefits to franchising. I know when when Schlotzky's fell apart, I felt like I'd lost part of my family. I mean, because you spend so much time and you go to conventions and my son's got to meet your kids when we were in Las Vegas. And, you know, just there's all that. Plus the people that you that you have come to you know fall in love with at the at corporate because they've been your business consultant or they help you find this location or for whatever it is and it's it's just it's a really close bond you, you know I think franchisees are starving to be successful I mean they just I want to prove my mother in law was not happy I quit my corporate job to go sell sandwiches right <laughs> I was desperate to prove to her that I had made a good business decision, you know? And so you want to prove to your, you know, your partner, your spouse, your kids, your neighbors that, you know, I, I was pretty smart. I mean, I did a good thing and I'm working hard and I'm successful and I build another one and I build another one. And oh, look at that red convertible in the driveway, huh? You know, so you, you know, you just, and when the franchisor can tap into that emotion that the franchisee really does want to be part of something bigger, and they're going to be well represent you in the market. That's the magic of franchising, right? You got an individual who's bleeding on the floor in Lincoln, Nebraska to be successful. You can't get that out of an employee, or at least I've never figured it out. So for candidates, when you're looking at franchises to invest in, to buy, is senior leadership committed to helping you be successful? We know the company's got to make money, but is there a place for both? You know, is the model set up so that the franchisor can make a, you know, decent return on investment, franchisees can do the same, and the customer's getting a tremendous product at the end of the day? That's the trifecta, you know? And how about the ownership model? Because there, there was that big trend in like 
what the eighties and nineties of like uh, publicly traded um, franchises, especially restaurant brands. Yeah. I think now there's like 60 or so publicly traded brands. So less than in the past. And there's a lot more that are private equity owned in fact. Do you see like the ownership model having an influence in terms of franchisee satisfaction or some of the data that that you're you're yeah. reviewing? Yeah. When when you get to so I had someone ask me one time, do you think you're an entrepreneur or are you an operator? Well, it depends. It's very entrepreneurial in smaller franchises. You know, so when I got into Shalovsky's, they were still searching for a lot of things. Now they had 200 locations, but they're still trying to get answers. And we were a test kitchen. And so we're, you know, rolling out new stuff. Does that work? Not, you know, so you're doing all that kind of stuff. When you get to where there's company-wide 500 or 1,000 locations, when they get, you're really just an operator then. And so I think there's place there for, you know, a company structure instead of an entrepreneur structure. Because if you own... 500 Wendy's. I mean, it's it's a it's just another big company, right? At that point, Patrick, it's not really the same kind of model where you're out there interviewing every candidate yourself and signing off and handing them a uniform and you know setting their schedules up. It's a big business then, thousand employees. I do I do concern myself a little bit with private equity. If I'm going to be honest, I think there is so much money going into private equity and so many. I worry that the franchisee is going to be lost somewhere. That it's all about the metrics and the it seems like it can work like there's some great examples of like growth equity coming in for brands like tropical smoothie cafe domino's wolfgang's bakery based here in miami where it kind of came in to really grow the brand and you can see the financial statements for a lot of these companies like where the first year p comes in like there's a there's a drop in earnings and it's to really reinvest in the brand and then you have other ones where they come in and kind of Kind of gut the brand yeah. and and uh, don't reinvest, and the profit jumps up from twenty percent EBITDA to forty five. Or I saw one franchise where that's forty eight percent earnings, where franchisees in that system are making like eight or nine percent. See, that's too tight. You know, anytime it's less, <laughs> you know, even a dime on the dollar is not enough. You know, and you get less yeah. than that, it's just going to be silly. So it really depends on the private equity folks. I mean, we do a yeah. fair amount of work with Rourke and the Inspire brands. And those, you know, they do what you're talking about. I mean, they, they're not going to just own it two years and flip it, cut expenses. And they hold for a long time. That's right. And that, so I think that's an advantage. If the franchise or is reinvesting in the business, providing resources that the franchisees didn't have before. I mean, there really is an opportunity to the upside. But like you mentioned, if it's just a, you know, the commercial, the picture I have in my mind is you're in this commercial marriage. and you got married to the founder and you've known him for years and blah, blah, blah. But you wake up some morning and you look on the other side of the bed and there's somebody there you have never met before. And <laughs> private equity has bought the, the founders out and they're gone. And all of a sudden now you're contractually obligated to somebody you've never met and you have no idea what they're. Well, I don't like that. I mean, I think that's dangerous, but it does happen. You know, I mean, we, we, you and I both talk to folks that have had things like that happen. So there's some interesting franchises where um, it's, it's kind of a, it's not private equity per se. It's more of like a, someone raising like a search fund or outside capital to come in, buy the business and, and be the, the CEO, you know, part owner through like a search fund. And you have that with Apex Leadership Company. There's a few other ones like in the clothing resale space that uh, franchisees have taken over or outside capital has come in where the capital group, a big, big part of it or some portion is that now CEO and mm -hmm. they kind of have their, their name on the line and ass on the line to, to ensure that there's going to be a success in that franchise brand. Well, there certainly are cases, examples of private equity really helping out some brands. The whole platform concept now that if we, if there's a, and there's a couple of what I'm working with right now that own six or eight franchises in the same kind of space, home services, you know, painting, roofing, all that kind of stuff. And so they have a platform that's all put into place and you take another complementary franchise organization and you already have all these things in place and it will work for all these, you know, folks. So I think that really makes sense, especially if it's an investment that I'm, I'm really going to hold on to. I mean, I want to 
as an owner, this is something I want to own. Not to say I'm never going to sell it, but my plan is I don't have a history of buy and sell, flip and flip and flip, because I don't think that's good, especially for franchisees, because you're a minority partner in this deal and you really have not much of a vote. So it really is important who's at the top of the franchise you're looking at. So Jeff, we've covered a lot today. What's the best way for franchisors, whether they're established or emerging and looking to really you know, grow their system in the right way with the right data to enter into contact to see if your services might be a good fit? Email is super easy. It's Fran Survey is the company, the short version of Franchise Research Institute. So it's jeff at fransurvey.com. And Patrick, I'm also going to send you a copy of our standard questionnaire that we use as kind of the template for everybody. Then if somebody reaches out to you, you can just share the questionnaire. I don't mind. So franchisees, if they're looking, what questions should I be asking the franchisor? You can share it. Or if there's a franchisor saying, you know, how can I just go ahead and send it out. And uh, yeah. if somebody gets in touch with me, great. If not, that's fine too. Awesome, Jeff. Really appreciate having you on. I appreciate being here. This is great fun. <laughs>